Welcome to the UIAAA Connection Podcast. Hometown Ticketing is proud to be the exclusive sponsor of the UIAAA Connection Podcast and to provide schools nationwide with the best options for digital ticketing for their events. Visit their website at hometownticketing.com to learn how they can make digital ticketing possible and simple at your school. Thank you to Hometown Ticketing for their exclusive sponsorship of the UIAAA Connection Podcast. Welcome back to another edition of the UIAAA Connection. I'm your host, Mark Hutch Hunter. Today we are more than pleased. We are excited to have the Administrator of Organizational Affairs from the NIAAA, Patty Conrad. Patty, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Mark. Why don't you begin by uh, sharing some of your stories when you were growing up, where you went to college, your first job, that type of thing. Oh, I don't think you want to hear <laughs> I do want to hear it. Our well, listeners want to hear that. Yeah. Uh, well, I went, I'm from um, Richmond, Indiana, which is on I-70 um, east of Indianapolis, right on the Ohio-Indiana line. I did not participate in high school sports. Um, I was, uh, I graduated in 1981. So girls sports had just started at the middle school level or junior high, which is what I went to. Um, and, um, we're just starting to evolve. So there was no feeder programs leading into the junior high. Junior high was it. And a lot of girls that tried out for the sports had never really played them before. Um, and I was not very coordinated to play sports. So I was um, on the drill team or pom-pom girl and in the mar- in the band, in the concert band. I marched as a pom-pom girl and then played an instrument in the concert band. Um, what did you play? Clarinet. Okay. Yeah. I still have it. I don't play it, but I still have it. Um Then I went to Indiana University from 81 to 85, um, studied in the School of SPIA, School of Public and Environmental Affairs. I was a, um, I got a uh, degree in um, public affairs with a concentration in mass communications, which would have been lobbying, um, but I didn't end up doing that. (laughs) Okay. I ended up moving to Indianapolis and working for a commercial developer, Browning Investments, and they had a small conference center um, in the office, in an office building downtown that we used as an amenity to the tenants, so they could book it uh, for um, meetings, training sessions. We had a lot of accounting firms that trained their new um, recruits, so I ended up managing that, and I did that. I don't know, until mid nineties. Then um, I ended up doing HR for the company. And then um, I ended up staying home for six years when I had Drew and Mary because they were 11 months apart. So that's my life. I don't want to tell you stories about college. (laughs) Well, no. So tell me, so where did you meet the love of your life, Andy? At IU. He was a Lambda Chi. I met him at the Lambda Chi house and he took me to a uh, Christmas party, the Lambda Chi Christmas party in 1982. So 39 years ago. Yeah. So we didn't start dating for about another year. We were good. We were friends. We connected. We went to dances together, but we really didn't start dating for about another year. And so you have three children. We already, you already mentioned Drew and Mary. The third yeah. one is the gambler, as I know her. Oh, my God. We <laughs> got married in 89. We had Olivia, our oldest, in 92. And then there's a quite a gap between Olivia and Mary. Mary was born in 2000. She was a 2000 baby. And Drew was born in 2001. And then now we have Olivia got married, and now we have Lucy. Our little granddaughter. Okay, well, that's oh, and that's sweet. Yes. And so I my uh, off the subject then. Where did where did young Mary get her gambling prowess? I think back to when I was on the board in two thousand nine, <laughs> and we were at 
maybe Ben and Jerry. I don't know. I can't remember where it was. But all I know is she was, she was telling yeah. everybody what, where, what to bet on the horses. And every time she bet, she was correct. Well, there was there was a system that she was going with. Um, when I started with the NIAAA, Mary was five and Drew was four. And Mary is now 21 and Drew is 20. So um, there were times they would tag along to events because I did, didn't have a choice. So she went to the um, Anderson. I don't know what they call that um, horse track now, but it's, mm -hmm. it's in Anderson, Indiana. We took the board and her job was to escort the board from the entrance to the stairs to get up to the private suite we had. Of course, you couldn't see her among anybody because she was so tiny. <laughs> But she did and a great job getting us there. I know that. She got you there. And Jean Ashen became her sidekick. So Jean Ashen, who's six. What is Jean Ashen? Six, six, maybe six. Five. Oh, my Lord. And little tiny Mary became baddies. Mary bet on everything, every horse that was pink. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And she won. I don't even know how much she won. It was maybe $30. And all she wanted to do with her money was buy a milkshake at the place. <laughs> so Jean took her down and got her a milkshake. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Well, let's go back a little ways. And why don't you mention some of the mentors or teachers that you had that had a big influence on your life? Oh, I had one that I can really think of um, in middle school or we had a junior high, seventh, eighth, and ninth. And um our ninth grade wasn't with high school back then. Uh, it was Mr. Young. He was my um, algebra teacher and he was also the basketball coach. Not that that mattered. I was a cheerleader. So I traveled with this athletic teams, but he, he, I can remember, I was very good in math. So I was very good in algebra and I didn't have any trouble with it, but kids did. And after each test, he would go back over that test problem for problem until everybody understood it. So if I got, and I usually got an A, I would sit through while he went back over it for every other kid. But I remember thinking how great that was because then it just reinforced what I knew. And in my ninth grade year, my parents bought a house and it was right next door to Mr. Young. <laughs> Okay. So his daughter and I became best friends, but he was my favorite teacher by far. All That's a great school. story. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Tell our audience here in Utah and across the United States and internationally, if I, I we are heard in a few countries, what made you decide to apply and take the job at the NIAAA? Well, I knew I had to go back to work because college was facing us with Olivia. She was in seventh grade. And um, I'd been looking on, um, I think it was Career Builder, or it was through the Indie Star. I don't remember, but um, I knew I had to look. And so I started looking, and my husband came home. He was working for the Indianapolis Chamber, and he said, I just signed up uh, two athletic directors that I used to referee for, and they're looking for an office manager. And I said, I don't want to be an office manager. I don't want to do that. <laughs> And he said, okay, okay. And he backed away. So I went online and I searched nonprofit because I had run a couple small associations out of my home while I stayed home those six years. And I thought, well, I'll just look in the nonprofit uh, part of the career builders. And there was this application that needed somebody with meeting experience, somebody with um, QuickBooks, which I had, and somebody with HR which I had. So it's like everything I had, you know, I thought I'd apply. And um, I remember one part of, they asked me for, you know, a resume, a cover letter and a letter of intent or a letter of something. I can't remember what it was. I'd never heard of it. So I locked myself in the office and I typed up why I should have the job. And um, the only thing I remember putting is that if I could organize three children and a husband who had a ref, ref, basketball referee career and mm -hmm. stay sane, I thought I could handle the job. 
but I, I just, and I turned it in and Mike, it said they were going to hire by July 30th and Mike didn't call me till August. And, um, Anyway, I interviewed and um, I just remember Bruce and Mike uh, asking me why they shouldn't hire me. What, what's the one reason they shouldn't hire me? And I told them it's because I had three kids and my kids came first. But after meeting Mike and Bruce, I knew, I knew that wasn't going to be an issue. And so what year was this that, that you were hired? 1985. No, and I, I have one other thing. When the kids started school, we all know <laughs> Bruce. We all know Bruce Whitehead. When my kids started right. school, they got on the bus at eight, like eight o'clock. So there was no way I could be to work by eight. And if I had to pay before school care, I had to pay after school care. Well, I already had somebody at the house to get them off the bus. I just didn't have anyone to get them on. So Bruce let me come in at 8.30 so I wouldn't have to pay the before and after care, which I thought was great. Plus he's frugal. <laughs> now, now that's, Plus he's that frugal. is our Bruce. No question yeah. about that. Now talk about to our audience, the difference of uh, today's athletic administrator and the differences you see in the office from when you began back in 2005. The newer guys do not seem to care as much about being involved in the state organizations. Um, a lot of them just want to get the classes and that's it. And um, I, you just don't see the, um, I don't know what you call it, the um, camaraderie. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It's very yeah. different. Belonging to an association is not as important now as it was back then. Um, we see it in our attendance at our award ceremony. Um, but then I see the athletic director today has more issues. And one of the biggest, I think, is social media. And so and expand vaping. on that. And vaping, huh? Well, yeah, expand on the... On the uh the social media end of it? Well, I think all schools have issues. These kids, they're, they're getting better, but when through the, you know, the whole social media process and kids putting things out there without thinking pictures or um, verbalizing on a coach they didn't like, I just think there's social media challenges. Okay. So, <clears throat> Reflect on your time working at the NIAAA, maybe share a couple of memories or stories you've had with ADs or board members, or because our audience may not know, you've got people, at least every February, you've got dozens and dozens of people, same in July. Of course, then you've got the coordinators meeting in September, but there, I'm sure there's other times that you've got people in the office. So share some of the stories and some of the, uh, the great memories you have. Oh my gosh. Well, I love taking the board to the Symphony on the Prairie. We do mm. that in July. Um, in the winter, it's a little harder. There's not much to do, but we try to do a Super Bowl um, event. I do know one February, um, little Mary had her birthday and, and something had happened and she was having a tough day. So she went with me to take the board to dinner and Doug Kilgore sang happy birthday to her and champs brought out like this seven layer cake and, and he, they brought out like six of them. Were you on the board? I think maybe. Well, and they no, gave it was, they it called was Kilgore it her, was after me. Okay. So they gave her her birthday party and everybody on the board got the seven layer cake. And of course it was free. So Bruce said I should bring her everything. Yeah. <laughs> to dinner. And uh, that, that was fun. I'm trying to think what else. Oh, the, another great one was the advisory conference advisory committee was the week of um, Super Bowl that was in Indianapolis. And wow. I think they call that press week. Something I'm like that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So um we brought the advisory committee in and the NFL experience was going on at the convention center, which was right across the street from the Hyatt. And um, 
we gave them passes and just told, instead of taking them to dinner and told them to go and have fun. And I remember Deanne Cromer from Iowa brought, I bet 10 helmets because they knew they were going in advance. So she brought 10 helmets and stood in line to get um, Dallas Clark's autograph because he was from Iowa and he autographed all of her helmets. And then the next day I was up real early getting ready. And she said, everybody watch Mike and Mike. I think that's a ESPN show, right? They were televising from Pan Am Plaza and there was Dion in the front row with her red mittens. (laughs) So it was just for me, it was nice that our attendees could experience the Super Bowl in Indy because it was actually very, very awesome. Well, speaking of the Super Bowl, I remember one of the years I was on the board. Let me preface this. It, it was at Champs that you talked about earlier, but now people that go to Indianapolis realize Champs is gone and it's some Gucci restaurant. Actually, I ate there last <laughs> September. I can't remember the name of it. Brew Burger. Yes, yes, Brew Burger. It's not so bougie. I, <laughs> so I, re, I remember when. Uh, so Peyton, so the Colts were playing, I think it probably was New Orleans. And I uh, think, that was the second Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the champs was just packed. And of course we had that back room and there was a bunch of us with the board and the PDA Watkins and, and Bales and all those guys were there. And I remember how crowded and how noisy it was until Peyton threw that last interception. And then all of a sudden the place was just empty. empty. <laughs> yeah. We were still there just waiting for it to end, but it was crazy. Yeah. I'm getting deliveries here. I'm watching through my window. Oh, okay. Um, that, that was, those are two, two fun memories. Um, I can remember, I'll tell this one. Don't kill me, Tracy Linen. When, um, Joni was president, we had our first board meeting in our new offices. So this would have been 07 Uh and we did symphony. It was either 07 or 08. And we did Symphony on the Prairie, and I had a Honda Odyssey van with a sunroof. With a sunroof, yeah. This is a great story. Continue. And and um, we drove people there, so we all had parking. Yes, I drove. Bruce drove. I don't. I don't remember who drove. And we're coming back from the prairie, and Tracy Linen did not want to go. She did not want to go, and we talked her into it. And I can't remember if it was um, Frank Sinatra or John Denver. It was one of the two. It was, it was Frank because I was there for the John Denver sound alike guy. Okay. So it was Frank. It was Frank Sinatra. It was our very first one. And Joni had her hanging out of the roof of my sunroof because I was driving the, the presidential motorcade. (laughs) <laughs> and Bruce calls my phone and says, get her back in the car right now. <laughs> <laughs> she was just having fun. It was just fun. Sorry, Tracy. <laughs> no, that's, that's a great story. I've, I've heard that story on more than one occasion. So thanks. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And while we're speaking about sharing, so you just got back from, this will air obviously a month from now, or maybe a little bit later. But share your observations regarding the recent NIAAA conference. And of course, it's been two years since we've seen each other. So give us your thoughts. And of course, I know you were frazzled as everybody that that works in the offices during the conference. But give us some observations about the Denver conference, including how fun it was to work with the union guys. (laughs) Well, one thing I learned is we need to read our contracts very, very carefully. and not just take the word of it's a union facility because all places are different. All states are different. There's will to work, right to work. All of it's different and it affects the union differently. So once we worked with them and figured out a plan, it it went s- smooth. But it's better to work with them than to try to fight it um, because there's a contract involved and we signed the contract. Um, I did notice we had close to 500 new attendees. So our attendance was down. I just got the number about 1758 attended. Um, So our numbers were down almost 500, but over 500 of those were new ADs. In other words, they've never been. 
And um, the workshops were full. I noticed all the workshops were full. People don't like to sit next to each other. So mm. unless you can set the room for double of what you expect, they're going to be standing. And the, we didn't have the capability to set for double of what we thought would attend. Um, people were just ready to get back and, and in person. I think that was um, the big thing. I noticed how excited people were to see each other. We um, ended up with a vaccine mandate two and a half weeks before we left. We, they were going to force everybody to be vaccinated to come. So the CVB of Denver went to uh, the state of Colorado and got a variance that allowed us to accept negative testing or we would or we would not have allowed have been allowed to have people who were not vaccinated and we ended up with only 60 people being tested out of that 1758 the rest set, brought their cards or were vaccinated and nobody complained they actually uploaded them showed them they were thrilled just to be there and so of the 60 tests, were any of them positive? No, they were all negative. All negative. Oh, well, that's... So it was good. And the nice, so the nice thing is, is Denver's numbers have gone down. Their ho- when this happened, their hospitals, we were told um, it wasn't necessarily Denver County that was bad. And where Denver is, they were bringing people in because the hospitals in the surrounding areas were um, full and they were one car wreck away from turning people away. So it's nice to know that by wearing the masks, it brought their numbers down and their hospitals are no longer besieged. They're full, but they're not to the point of where they were. So do you think the uh, decline in attendance might have been due partially to the, obviously the COVID and Yes. Some districts not letting uh, 80s travel that would normally be there. Yes. Um, we had almost 100 cancellations. So we had over almost 1,900 register and then 100 cancellations came in. Um, the, the, very, or the cases have gone up everywhere. Schools stopped letting, um, would not let their 80s leave because they didn't have enough subs. So they needed all staff in the building. Um, I think I only had two people cancel because they did not want to wear a mask. Other than that, it was school districts um, putting into place travel advisories and not letting them leave. Sure. And so expand on that, because I believe in a normal year, you wouldn't have maybe 10 cancellations at the most. Right. Normally we get anywhere from 25 to 30 depending, but it's generally illness at home and emergency, something to that effect. Yeah. We had quite a few not be able to come because they made it to the football finals. <laughs> okay. Well, that's in some States. Um, but most of it was the school district. So I think uh, Nashville will be bigger. I do. Cause okay. I hope I'm hoping by Nashville, we have got this. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I would hope so. Well, I, and I will share with you because I was a, I was close to not attending myself. So, and I can't remember if I shared this with you, but so this would have been the Tuesday before. So this is what, 10 days out of, of that Thursday when I got there. Uh, the, the, Deb gets her uh, booster because she'd already been vaccinated. And then after the booster, she thinks she's having a reaction to it. So she goes and gets tested as a precaution and she has it. So she comes wow. home. So I spent every day until I left for Denver upstairs. And of course, Deb was downstairs. I deliver her meals because if I would have got it after her, then you would have been, uh, then I would, she really would have been have 101. It? She had it. She had it. It was it, not it, from had, the booster. It, no, it was fever and chills. And, and so I thought, oh, maybe it's a reaction to, to having it but I've heard people have reactions, but I didn't know what it was, but she went and got tested as a precaution. She said she had it. And so I would deliver her breakfast, lunch, and dinner, knock on the door. And then, um, <laughs> and then to, uh, to add insult to injury, our washer went out. 
So I, I spent uh, three separate days taking my wash in the bag to my daughter's house to get clean, to come back because I didn't want to go to a laundromat. But anyway, the washer's here now. We're back. She Obviously, I canceled her flight with me on Thursday, and then I flew her out there Saturday. So it was 10 days, so it was actually 11 for her. But yeah, that's been a huge, huge mess. Let's change gears a little bit now and talk about every February and every July, you meet with the board, but mm -hmm. every February, the board has, well, probably three or four different members. So it's not, you know, the board, but, and you probably know the people coming in because they've been around the NIAAA, but talk about how it's different and the mechanics of working with uh, a different, because each board, even only a third of them have changed out, has a different personality and a different mm -hmm way to attack things so speak to that well i don't i i'm not in the meetings you know that um but everybody's very different and i think uh, the first time i uh, experienced that was in 08 we had moved out i i didn't do anything with the board meetings until 08 or 07 the summer of 07 when we moved to the new office and then in 08 was my first winter and that's the first time people rolled off and i remember the, when people got here, I'm like, where's, where's so-and-so? Yeah. Well, they rolled off and I'm like, oh, and I mean, it was really hard because you become very connected to these board members over the three years they're here. And it's, it's kind of sad. It, it's very sad. But then after a while, I realized they never really go away because they're utilized in areas like strategic plan, um, new committees that come on, like mentoring, uh, the cohorts. Um, so the association is ever changing and to keep up with the times and the board members that go off, generally you see them maybe a year or two down the line, come back for something else. Um, but it's just getting to know their names. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. and their faces because you don't always know who they are before they get here and um, tra get, not training them but getting them to understand um, how the shuttle works you know the hotel right. um, the office you know all of that so it's it's not hard it's not okay well share with share with our listeners here in utah and across the nation uh any of the of the new best ideas or best practices or or if there was a couple of things that uh, ad should be doing obviously to make their job easier and to make your job easier in the office well one is take the lti courses for sure take the lti courses two write down your member number and your login information yes. <laughs> to the portal <laughs> And that would make lives easier. So someday I'm going to write a book on questions I've been asked. Oh, and that, Fran, that would... Fran Flannery and I were always going to write a book, always going to write a book. Um, but that would be the best thing they could do is write that and read the emails of ours that go out. Um, social media for us has been a positive because it's not uh -huh. used negative, negative wise. And read the emails that we send and look at the social media and just stay on top of things. Don't delete those emails, keep them and read them because 99 times out of 10, they will call us and ask us exactly what was in that email. And then you say, uh, we sent you an email three days ago and yeah. this stuff was in there. Yeah. And, 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 and it could be being filtered. So we sure. always tell them to go to their IT um, in their district and get us permission to be right because they could be blocked or they could go right. to spam or whatever right right share with our listeners what's the favorite part of your job oh um pro probably the meeting part just because we get to see everybody that's and my so, favorite part and yeah. so having said that how was the at least 15 months of covid that you had in the office like we had everywhere else and just obviously you got to, to zoom them but that's that's not the same um well 
I can remember picking my kids up at Indiana University um, a day early for spring break. They, they had no plans because um, they wouldn't have been going. <laughs> yeah. Did. And um, a couple, my daughter's an Alpha Chi, and a couple Alpha Chi's came back from Europe, Lombardy, the Lombardy, Italy area where um, there's an IU study program. And they came to the Alpha Chi house even though they were told not to come back to campus at all. And of course they tested positive. And one girl they came back with took a train from Chicago to St. Louis and infected her father who went to a school dance with his other daughter, is it Villa Danouche, where um, Dory Smith used to be. Sure. Uh And infected the whole dance. So um, our daughter calls hysterical. We go down and get our kids. And I come into work on that Friday and Mike pulls us in about 10 in the morning and says, everybody pack it in. We're going to be working from home. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And he said, no, we're working from home. And I think I was just shocked that we were actually going into this quarantine. And finally in June, um, if we felt comfortable because we all have individual offices, we could come back, but we had to be masked in the common areas and in the building. So in June, I started coming back two or three days a week. Mike and Phil were here and Cheryl. Um, I think it was harder for us to work from home than our um, younger employees. They were, they were so used to being online for classes and all kinds of stuff. Um, so it was just, it, it changed the whole dynamics of the office. Um, we, we still now have, um, part work from home, part work in the office and, um, not planning the conference was just very devastating. Um, Lannis Robinson was our president and the conference was to be in Tampa where he's the district AD of Tampa Bay schools. And we had Tony Dungy as our speaker. And it just was really devastating to think what our people were missing. Um, but we, we did the online. Um, I can remember still going out into the lobby area of the online and looking for people like I was going to see some. Yes. <laughs> it was just stupid, but, you know, anything to just see a face. And um, it just made it a long two years. And I know everybody else probably feels the same way. It did. We still kept going. We still kept going. Everybody was employed. Sure. We figured out how to run courses through Zoom because the states couldn't run them at their conferences because they were canceled. It was, we, we figured out how to meet the needs of our membership in a whole different way. Let's finish up with the, uh, the last two questions. The first of which is, you've got two things, two items you wanna share with a brand new AD, somebody between four and years, or excuse me, between one and four years. And these things would absolutely be essential to their progression as an AD. What would those two items be as a must to be successful? One, take Lee Green's legal courses. Take all of the legal courses. And two, attend the conference and get involved. That would be my two. Well said. I I couldn't say it better. I have nothing to add to that. (laughs) So let me let me finish with this. What not questions? that any courses you teach, Mark, are right. good. Oh no, no, no. And and that's <laughs> there's I, I will just put this plug in and I've said it numerous times. There's we have Lee Green to Utah as often as we can get him. And he teaches two of the legal courses one year and two the next year, and he alternates. So everyone in Utah could take them within the two-year period. There's there is no one. There is no one like Lee Green. So yeah. thank you for sharing that. Let me ask you this. What question should I have asked you that I failed to ask? I don't know. How can I sit next to a Kentucky Wildcat at work every day? You didn't ask. Well, me. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's so, going. <laughs> how, how, how is it having an office right next to Bad Moon Rising? And well, I can Indiana hear it. University and the University of Kentucky. How I have my IU holiday reef on my window uh-huh. and all my logins are um, related to IU, which drives them crazy. And 
we just, we don't say too. We go back and forth a little bit, but not much, but uh, he is a Kentucky Wildcat. <laughs> well, Keeps things hopping in this office. Oh, I'm sure. We, we I'm just sure. lost Cheryl, who was our Purdue, yes. Purdue grad. So we just well, lost Cheryl. Well, you so, lost Cheryl and you lost Bruce. Well, it's probably been what, five years ago now? He was a uh, boy maker. 15. It was 15. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so yeah, lost we lost Purdue. our Purdue. So Purdue yeah. is not represented. And then, and I, I'm not even sure where, where the young people are all from. Oh, see, Mike went to ISU. Our new employee, Kathy, went to DePaul. Uh, to Taylor, to Taylor University, uh, which uh -huh. did their silent night last night. If you watch Sports Center, they did their silent night. Oh, it's, that was them? Uh -huh. I was just I kind of saw it out of the. Uh -huh. That's Taylor. And then um, uh, Sharice went to Austin P and then grad school at WKU, Western Kentucky. Kentucky. And Alex went to, I think, Eastern Michigan, Eastern or Western Michigan, one of the two. So East yeah, it's, yes. so the, the big Michigan. division one is Mike and there's Phil and I. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's awesome. Thanks for, for sharing that. That wraps up another edition of the UI AAA Connection. Once again, our guest today has been Caddy, Patty Conrad, the Administrator of Organizational Affairs for the NIAAA. Thanks for being on today, Patty. Thanks, Mark. For our listeners, we hope you tune in next week for another edition of the UI AAA Connection. 